So we've been on the topic of love. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm basically taking something that I'm teaching on Wednesday night and then re, redoing it in a sermon format for Sunday. If you were following what we do on Wednesday and you listen to what I preach on Sunday, you will find that it is a whole lot different. Um, some similarities, but I, I'm basically I have I have eight pages of notes into one and a half pages. So it's a little different. And um, today I want to share a message on loving as God desires, to love as God as God loves. How do we know we are acting in love and the kind of love that God is looking for? How do we know that we are acting on that? How do we know we're actually living and loving the way that God wants us to love? We have all kinds of ideas how we think God wants us to love. We know we can grab verses and say, I'm going to take this verse to make it my life. I'm going to take this verse to make that one my life. And that's what, that's how I define how I love. You know, I, I've heard Christians say, I only love those who love me. And if they don't love me, I don't have to love them. I've heard it said, we don't have to love non-believers. We only have to love believers. I've also heard it said, we only have to love believers to go to our church. And only if they're, you know, in my age bracket. And only if they sing what I sing. And only if. They gossip the way I gossip, but only if, only. And sometimes we can really, really, we can segregate people and we can really begin restricting um, where our love goes and how our love goes. But sometimes we don't realize that we love money more than we love people. We love TV more than we love people. I remember one one, you know, one Sunday, uh, one week visiting an uncle, and he was part of a, uh, a very, very strict Pentecostal church. I mean, it's extreme. This, you know, there's these families of God, then there are, there are very, I wouldn't say extreme because that doesn't sound right, but very legalistic Pentecostal churches. The hair, the, you know, long hair, no makeup, you know, the whole nine yards. And I have I had an uncle and aunt that belonged to one of those churches, and they subscribed to it with all their passion. And so I visited them one day you know, after I had become pastor here, because they lived not too far. And I just went to spend some time with my uncle and aunt. And, and we're sitting there, and we're talking, and we're catching up a little bit. And my uncle is looking at the clock, and, you know, and as that clock gets to around 11 o'clock, he says, he says to his wife, you know, I've got to turn on the TV. And much to my surprise, our visiting stopped at 11 o'clock because the Young and the Restless started at 11 o'clock. And once the Young and the Restless started, it was no more conversation in that house. I mean, the TV was small because those, those really strict Pentecostals, you didn't have a big TV in the, in the living room. So if you go visit them in the living room, you won't find a TV because that big old TV in the living room is thin. But that little box, not bigger than this hymnal, sitting on the kitchen table, was acceptable. And there we're watching the young and the restless, as I like to say, the old and the worthless, the young and the pitiful. And I just was taken by that. I thought, I would think that in this place we would sit and have a conversation and, and talk. It's like, we can't because there's a soap opera on. I mean, who watches soap operas? The world does. It just caught me by surprise. This has never changed how I felt about my uncle and aunt. They were, they were great people. They loved the world with all their heart. They supported, they lived, they served. And, and I, would, I would never think I would send them for a heart, not for a second, not for a heart. It just struck me. Because there are, sometimes our passions come out. Where are our passions? And based on those, we we can sometimes take that and say, that's how I live, and that's how God lives, so that's how I live. So our passions and our views can be skewed. How do we love as Jesus loved? In 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 24, 
John's writing to the church. These, he is later in life. They were talking about A.D. 70, A.D. 80. So Jesus has long since come and gone, lived, died, rose again. The first century church has now been moving through for uh, about 50 years or more. Um, and, uh, and growing between the, Je the Jewish community and the Gentile community and the Gentiles between the Greek community and the Roman community. And now we're getting to uh, the other end of, of John's life. The other disciples the, or apostles have all died, uh, been crucified or uh, cut or hung or whatever was done to them, put to death. John was allowed to live into his old age. And he sees issues that are, that are arising in the church, and he's concerned. And the one we covered on Wednesday night was Gnosticism. And you have to go look that up to see what that's about. But we covered mostly that on Wednesday night. That was one of the major topics that John takes issue with when he writes. But he also takes issue with the church being able to love each other than how to measure their ability to love. And the, the measurement is, can we love as God loves? For this is the message you heard from the beginning. Verse 11, we should love one another. Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Lord, let your word speak powerfully and wonderfully in our hearts and our lives, I pray. Oh, in the name of Jesus. Oh, amen. So how do we know that we are acting in love as God desires us to? Let me give you three quick points on loving. Number one, how do we know? How do we, how do we do this? And how do we know it's right? The first few verses, verses 11 through 15 of this text, tells us that we need to love by cherishing your family. You love by cherishing your family. Who's your family? Specifically, John speaks of the, the family of God. So John is speaking of your brothers and sisters in the Lord. We can think of family as our family is my, my, my husband, my wife, my kids, the grandkids, nephews, nieces, cousins, uncles, aunts, so on. 
we think of our family and then our extended family. But John is saying specifically, it's the family of God. Do you cherish the family of God? Do you look at your brothers and sisters in the church and say, oh, I care about them. I'm concerned for them. I genuinely hope that they're doing okay. I genuinely celebrate with them when they, when they celebrate. And I genuinely weep with them when they are heartbroken and they weep. Can we say that we do that? Can we say that's part of our life? That we can look at the body of Christ and say, I love them. God loves and treats others as family members. God, God looks at us and he loves us as though we are, we are the family of God. He is challenging. John is challenging the church. You need to see yourselves as God sees you. God sees you as his dear children. And God cares for you. He, he looks to you. He wants to cover you. He wants to hold you. He wants to direct you. He wants to be in your life and comfort you. And yes, correct you. You know, some of us really like that scripture. Whom he loves, he chastises. Some of us take that verse and say, oh, that's mine, baby. And every time I think somebody's out of line, I just can't wait to chastise. I, somehow it's the first trick of the bell. And the only way people are going to know that I love them is if I beat them. You know, you really need to be careful with that. Because you beat a dog long enough, he'll bite you back. You know, you, 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 beat, your, you beat your kids long enough and they're going to beat you. You know, you, that's right. You know, we grew up with that song about, um, about the guy who never had time for his kids. Everybody remember that old song from the 70s? He never had time for his kids. And then his kids got older and guess what? They never had time for the old man. The cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. The little boy blue and the man in the moon. When are you coming home, son? I don't know. I'm too busy. Well, when I was a kid, that's what you told me. I spent my whole life where you told me you were too busy. I spent my whole life where you were always away because everybody else was always more important than me. So now I'm an adult and I got married and I have kids. And guess what, Dad? I'm too busy for you. And, and that song, it ends where dear old dad says, you know what? I got what's coming. That's how that song ends. I got what's coming to me. I have reaped what I have sown. So be careful. You think it's, it's God's wisdom for you to beat somebody because you love them. You be careful. Because that will come back to reach on you. you. You will live to regret that someday. Because that is not love. And you can get that in prison. Come on, Mike. Right? That's what you do to a prisoner. You in a, in a bad prison. I mean, even now you can go to you can get arrested, you can get fired for beating an inmate, and yet in the Christian homes, like, yeah, I'm gonna get them. I love them. Be careful. God says, I love you with an everlasting love. I love you so much. God says, I love you so much. I'm not out to beat you. In fact, I love you so much. I will send my son to be beaten by his enemy. I will send my son to be beaten by the world. I will send my son to die on a cruel cross just to show you how much I love you. I will send my most precious into a world of viciousness and vengeance and hatred and, and man-made religion. I will send him into that cold, dark world to get all that the world can throw at him until he hangs on that cross. That's how much I love you because in his innocence and in his dying on that cross, unknowing to that whole dark world, he is making a way for you to come home to me. The depth of God's love. The depth of God's love is not experienced in how many beatings we can take. The depth of God's love is how, how much we can experience and receive his love in our hearts and our lives. Can we receive his love in our hearts and in our lives. Church is called to love as God loves. 
And the contrast we're given in these verses is Cain and Abel. You all remember the story of Cain and Abel? They both make a sacrifice and they both bring an offering and one gets accepted and one does not. Because God looks at, at Cain's uh, uh, offering and says it's not acceptable. In fact, here John says that the, 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 the gift given by Cain was considered unrighteous. It was not what God told him he wanted. Because it, it required blood for the remission of sin. Not grapes and apples and oranges and bananas. Not wheat and corn. Or whatever you can get out of that field that in their time. And so John said it was a tale of unrighteousness versus righteousness. And when God tells Cain that he does not receive his offering, God talks to Cain and explains to Cain how he must respond to God's rejection of his offering. And that's in John 4, 7. I mean, Genesis, rather, 4, 7. You know, the story leading up is everything that I just said. And then he rejects Cain's offering. And he tells, he tells Cain this in verse 7. And boy, we ought to take a lesson from this. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? You didn't do what was right, Cain, but if you do what is right, won't I accept you? Will I not accept you? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Look at what God tells Cain. Sin is crouching at your door, temptation. God already knows the temptation that's beginning to settle down into, into Cain. He already knows the things that Cain is feeling. He's feeling bitterness, but his bitterness is toward Abel. God, God knows that there, there is something. There is a rift, and the rift is because God did not accept Cain's sacrifice. Cain is looking at his brother and saying, you think you're better than me. God accepted you, but didn't accept me. Well, I know how to fix this. I just get rid of you. If I get rid of you, all that's left is me. Now God has no choice. And look at God's words to Cain. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? If you do what is, if you do not do what is right, then sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. What is the sin crouching at Cain's door? His hatred for his brother is the sin that is crouching at his door. His vengeance, his, his thirst for vengeance is the sin that's crouching at his door. And if you go on and read verse 8 and verse 9 and verse 10, what does Cain do with this temptation, with this sin crouching at his door that God said, be careful, son. Own up. Own this thing. Overcome it. It should not rule you. You rule over it. It don't rule over you. And Cain went out and said, oh, yeah, watch me. Abel, you got a minute? Let's go meet in the field. Let's go have a conversation, brother. Let's go have some, some brother time, one-on-one -on -one brother time. And Abel goes out unsuspecting, saying, oh, yeah, we're going to bond. Brother bonding. Yeah, Moses, you got a lot of brothers. Go out and bond and crack some heads. I know, I know how brothers can be when they get out. I have, I have a brother, and uh, I can tell you some stories of how many times we cracked heads, mostly mine, because I'm the younger. Brother bonding. And when they get out there, Abel lets Cain know how he feels. And Abel does, I'm rather, Cain does everything that God told him not to do. And this scripture becomes fulfilled in a negative way. Because God warned him, sin is crouching at your door. And it will have you. When Cain killed Abel, sin opened a door. Cain invited it in. And Cain said, let's work together. And they killed Abel. He let his sin rule. And in his sin, he killed 
That's why Jesus reminds us. And that's why John, 50 years later, reminds us. Murder doesn't begin when you stab, when you shoot, when you cut, when you beat. Murder doesn't begin when you take the life of somebody. Murder begins when you, when you are provoked in your heart, when you think it in your heart. Murder is when you decide in your heart, I'm going to kill this person. I'm going to end this person. I'm going to get my revenge on this person. That's when I kill. That's murder. And that's why John can say here, the very act of wanting to take someone's life, the very act of hatred, the hatred is murder. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. If you hate your brother, you have murder. So what is stewing in our hearts? We should heed God's advice, shouldn't we? We should heed God's advice. We should recognize the hatred that might be lurking in our own hearts. How can we love a brother we can't stand? How can we love a sister we can't stand? How can we love somebody that we so easily paint them as somebody that is our opposition? If you have somebody in church that loves the Lord, you can't go looking at them and saying, can I find something we don't agree on so I can decide to hate them or dislike them or not want to associate with them or not want to fellowship with them? I could tell you some stories of even how church people don't behave well. But this should not be a sermon about everything we're doing wrong. But it's easy for, for Christians to not be in the love of God and feel like they're right in carrying out behavior and attitudes that do not reflect the love of God. We have to be careful, don't we? Because if we're going to act in love as God desires, we need to heed his advice. And his advice, sin is crouching at your door. Be in charge of it. Don't let it be in charge. Sometimes sin is crouching at our doors as Christians. And we're tempted to go do things and feel things and say things that we know aren't right. Be in charge of it. Overcome it. We've been made overcomers, haven't we? You've been made more, more than conquerors in this land through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to get over some of the stuff that we have to walk through in life. We don't always have to win. We don't always need to be number one. And sometimes we need to be in second place and, and, and telling somebody, hey, Good job. I mean, look where we are as a nation. As soon as somebody wins, the other side wants to have a, you know, a, a, a um, we're, we're, we are, we're not a very brotherly nation. And that goes both ways. If you think, oh, pastor, our nation is split and divided. We are not a nation of brotherly love. Philadelphia, you cannot you cannot put that title over the United States of America because we are no longer a nation of brotherly love. We are we are a nation that is uh, divided and at each other's throats. As soon as it's somebody we don't agree with, we just <sighs> you have to interpret what that means if you can't see me on on uh, online. Second love. How do we know we are acting in love as God desires? First is we need to cherish our family. Second, we need to sacrifice for the good of others. You will know that you love as God loves if you are able as a Christian to, to love by sacrificing for the good of others. Chapter 3, verses 6 through 8, 16 through 18. God loves, a godly love sacrifices for the good of others. Never using others for personal benefit. Even in the church, sometimes if we're not careful, we can look for opportunities and say, this person can really benefit me. Oh, really? You work on cars? Oh, I've got three cars, and you can help me, brother, because you're a Christian, and you, you owe me because we're all brothers in the Lord, and you're not supposed to have... You're not supposed to get any money from me, so therefore I need I need I, I need my oil change and I, I need my transmission fixed and, 
and oh yeah, I gotta have a new water pump. But you're a, you're a brother in the Lord in the church. You should be fixing my car. When we catch that attitude, don't we have that a little backwards? Now just think of me for a moment. Because if I'm if I'm an auto mechanic and I go to a church, I don't expect for the church to look at me and say, with your talent, you owe me. But what I do expect as an auto mechanic, if I were going to a church, is that if I heard that there was somebody in the church that had need, maybe it was, quote, the little old lady who's living on peanuts for retirement. And, and, I, and I heard that somebody didn't, needed an alternator or they needed a new water pump. And I thought, oh, you know what? I could, I could take an evening and I said, I'm just going to go up to her and I'm going to say, you know, ma'am, I heard that you have a problem with your car. Yes, and my water pump went, and I just, I don't know how I'm going to get it fixed, but you know what, I'll be, you know, God, to God, to God, to the glory, he'll make a way, and like, ma'am, can I come out on Tuesday night, and let me look at your car and see if I can fix it. I can't make any guarantees until I get in there and look at it, but if I can, I will, I will do what I can. Now, now, who's initiating that? The auto mechanic, right? Who has heard that somebody might be in need. We should not look at the body and say, you, you owe me whatever your talent is. Brian, you're a carpenter, and we are, we are entitled to use you as much as we can until you're totally spent. You know, in reality, you want to see how fast a person like Brian leaves the church? If the rest of the congregation looks at him and says, we are entitled to your skills, and why should we pay for somebody to do work in my house when you're here? No, we don't walk through life saying that somehow we're entitled to the abilities and the, and the well-being and the good nature of the body of Christ. But as the body of Christ, we should be able to look at each other and recognize when someone is in need and say, I think I can do that. I feel like I can, it ought to come from the person who has the ability to do it. It's like someone who comes into the church and you find out that they're an owner of some business or some corporation, and we know they're just flowing in money. They, they throw away more money in one day than we make in a whole month. And they say, oh, we got a rich guy in the church. He makes like $10 million a year. We're done. Nobody has to tithe anymore. This tithe alone will take care of the whole church budget. And you know, if you had a guy who made $10 million a year and he tithes, it would it would be there would be ten years of budget. If a guy came into church in, in our church and he had and he made ten million a year from his business and he ties one million a year, our budget's a hundred thousand or a little less than a hundred thousand a year, that would be ten years of our budget every single year. Boy, what we could do. Hey, you're the rich guy, write another check. Every time we need something, hey buddy, got a check. You know, how do you think that person feels after about the third or fourth or fifth time that we've asked him to write another check? Feels like he's a, well, he's a prostitute. Like we're buying him. Somehow we're entitled because he has it. Why can't he feel led by the Lord to do what he feels God's calling him to do? Why do we have to tell him that he owes us? Why can't he feel like God wants to use him to take care of someone's needs? That's what John's getting to, is that brotherly love, you allow people to rise up and be inspired. You don't tell people how they will be inspired. You rise up and let people be inspired by the same Holy Spirit that's inspiring you. Does that make sense, a brotherly love? When we sacrifice, when, when we give, when, when God sacrificed his son, he gave his son out of love that we might have life. When we sacrifice for the, for the greater good of the body of Christ, we sacrifice for their benefit, not for ours. We do for someone else, not for someone else to do for us. We look for someone else's needs and we are empathetic to someone else's needs. The Bible says we ought to lay down our lives for 
the benefit of our brothers and our sisters. We don't lay down our life for the benefit of us. What can we get out of it? So what can our brother or our sister benefit by our sacrifice? The Charettes are going to Mozambique. I have been following the stories this past week of Mozambique. They are going into a war zone. They are going into a war zone like nothing that I have seen in recent years in Africa. Those, uh, those, those Muslim ISIS guys are going in and they're going from village to village throughout Mozambique and they go in and they, they hunt down the guys, they grab the guys by the hair of the head, and they take them out and they behead them. The women and the children run into the bush, to try to find a place in the tall grass or in a tree and hide behind. And when the ISIS, after they slaughter all the men in the village, they go out into the field, they go to the bush, they go to the trees, and they find all the women and children, and they drag them back into the village forcefully. And they bring them back into the village and then they slaughter the women and children just because they can. And they pile up the carcasses in the middle of that village. As a reminder to anybody else, this is what happens if you don't join us. And they are going from village to village and they're doing that from village to village and nobody seems to be able to stop them. So we have a missionary taking his, his wife and two kids to that country and Jeanette said, oh, it's not anywhere near where they're going. And I thought, that doesn't, that doesn't seem right. It seems like what I'm hearing is the whole country is moving in this direction. And then we hear today that I was right. Because they recognize it right in their backyard. So they're going into a war-torn area. And why? Because the rest of us, you look at it, I don't go near that place. That's not what's to be. I'm not taking my kids there. <laughs> I love ministry, God. I'll go help you, God, anywhere, but I'm not taking my kids there. He's going to take his two kids. He's going to go to Mozambique because he loves the children there. And he loves the people there so much that they'll take that chance. His wife said, you know, I'm scared to death of what's going to happen to my kids, but I trust the Lord more. I trust the Lord more. Could we say that? Could we take our kids and trust the Lord with our kids? And say, Lord, I'll go there even though I don't, I'm not sure my kid will survive. I'll go because I know, God, that's, that's, that's your calling on my life. They're not going because they got a martyr syndrome. They're going because they feel it's God's call. And God could just as easily take care of them like we prayed today, a bubble all around them, the hand of God protecting them the whole time. And they could come back in two years and give testimony of the great ministry that happened, despite all the Islamic stuff happening around them. So they're not going because they've weighed out and they see, they see that they can, you know, they can be protected by man. They're going trusting God for his protection. They're just going by faith. You can look at it and say, that's foolish faith. But I, I'm, I'm not sure that I could even find the proper phrase, foolish faith. How is faith foolish? Well, the Bible says that our faith is foolish to men. So yeah, men thinking can think they're foolish. But if they really believe that that's God, then what seems foolish to men is God's call for their life. So let it go. Okay, God. So here's the way that we wrap up point two, how we love and sacrifice. Three things that I want to leave you with before I go to the next point. One, observation. Know your world. If you're gonna, if you're gonna sacrifice, you're gonna, you're gonna give what you can to your world. How do I, how do I lay it down for my world? Know your world. Observe your world. How can you help someone if you don't even know who they are? If you don't even know what their needs are? Observe your world. Second, we need to be Christians who are empathetic. We need to have empathy. We need to feel what people are feeling. We need to feel and know and understand what people are going through. If we're cold and hard-hearted, we can cross the other side of the road like the Good Samaritan story and have no regard to no, no, no uh, concern, no compassion for somebody lying on the side of the road, bleeding and dying, 
but where's the empathy? Where's the compassion? Where's the care? As Christians, if we're going to love by sacrificing for the good of others, there needs to be the empathy for our brother and sister in the Lord. And third, there needs to be love. How you care for your world. How you care for your world. Think of this verse in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11. And that is what some of you were, the lost. Paul writes about how you were, the way you lived. And he has a list of sin, of how you once were living in sin. But, verse 11, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. But God, you are, you are standing and you are sitting and you, you are part of a church where we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and we are made whole through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are made as the brothers and sisters in the Lord. So we look at our world and see our world dying and our world is lost and our, our world is corrupt and our world is evil. It's split, it's divisive, it's mean, it's vengeful. We see all of that of our world and we, we look at through the eyes of someone who has been redeemed. Can we, can we see our world as a world that is lost? And Lord, have mercy on them. They are lost. Can we see the world as Jesus sees it? What did Jesus say when he died on the cross? And he is, he is dying and the nails are in his hands and the nails are in his feet. The crown on his head. He's been ushered and lifted up on a, on a cross. There he is naked, bleeding, dying. All the shame you could put on a man right there out on that hill with two others. One of them is mocking him while the other is saying, oh, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. But what does Jesus say in regard to the human race and the human race that puts him on that cross? Forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Now, we look at it and say, oh, of course they knew what they were doing. They sent him through, they took him to kangaroo court. They had it all set up. That well, the whole thing was a setup. It was a, you know, say it was a sham. Like what we say about the stuff in the politics in our own world. A sham. What is this? It was no different then. Of course they knew what they were doing. And yet, because of their sin, Mike, they didn't know what they were doing. Because they had no clue that he was the Christ. Because they rejected him. Our world has rejected Jesus. So, of course, they don't know who Jesus is. They don't have an appreciation for who Jesus is. So they act the way they do. Stephen, when he's being put to death, and the people are all gathered while Saul is holding the coat. So they grab the stones, and they stoning Stephen. Stephen utters very similar words as Jesus did. And he says to God, you know, after he says, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, which irritated them even more. Because they don't believe in this Jesus that he's preaching. And they stone him. And before he falls asleep, the Bible says, he utters those words, forgive them. Because they don't know what they're doing. The very people putting him to death. They knew exactly what they were doing. They were enacting capital punishment for someone who was still claiming he belonged to this Jesus that was crucified. But they didn't know what they were doing because they couldn't appreciate who Jesus was. They could not appreciate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They could not appreciate this love that Jesus is pouring into people's lives. They could not appreciate the healings and deliverances that are happening on a daily basis, the dead people coming back to life on a regular basis, they could not appreciate that because they did not understand and they did not accept who Jesus Christ was. My friends, it's no different today. People are being healed all the time. People are being delivered on a regular basis. People are being saved and receiving Christ as their Savior. And the lights come on, the darkness flees, and they feel such peace in their lives. And it's so incredible. Yet the world says, oh, that's not real. That's just your crutch. 
I've been told more than once that I have a crutch it's called religion. I want to tell you, for me, the real crutches is alcohol. The real crutch is crap, cocaine, heroin, pills. The real crutch is to prostitute every other night. That, that's the real crutch. Crutches is the lying and the cheating. All the sins that this world that men can can experience and come up with and practice, those are the crutches. The need to lie every other day just to cover yourself, that's the crutch. Jesus, in my view, smashes all the crutches. When I have Jesus Christ in my life, he's not a crutch. He got rid of my crutches. I stand free and I stand tall in Jesus Christ. I don't stand with the help of a stick. Sorry, Gary, but in our on our body sometimes we yeah, I'm not talking about that one. We we I stand tall without the spiritual or the unseen sticks of sin. I stand tall in Jesus Christ. Come on. The last point is that we love by showing confidence. Verses 19 through 24. And here, it's godly love makes us increasingly confident of God's care. Be confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you shall perform it until the day of who? The day of who? The day of who? Be confident of this very thing, that he who began, I'm quoting Philippians, that he who began a good work in you shall perform it until the day of, nobody's saved here, until the day of, Here's a hint. His blood covers your sins to the day of. Thank you, Jesus Christ. He who began a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. What that means is until the day that he returns. And so all this time, you have the covering, the shed blood, the deliverance, the salvation. You have the confidence of the Lord on your side. As long as you have Jesus Christ, you have, you have the hero. You have the leader. You have the redeemer. You have the king of kings, the lord of lords. You have the lion of Judah, as we sung today in our song. You have the best of the best of the best on your side. And John, when he writes, he says, first of all, if you don't have enough confidence, because, because sin makes you feel un unconfident, unconfident, the opposite, you, because you feel it's condemnation. If you lack confidence in Jesus Christ's ability to work in your life, John says it's because of sin. It's simple. I really don't know that I can trust the Lord. I really don't know that, you know, God really forgives me. I'm really not sure. And John says, if, if you start losing confidence in Jesus, John's argument is, that's because of sin. Doubt is sin. Second guessing by doubt is sin. Wanting to hold a grudge against somebody else, it darkens your heart. It hardens your heart. That's sin. All the different things that can happen in your mind, in your heart, in your emotions, in your body, it's all sin designed to take you away from God. But John has good news here. He says, God is greater than your sin. That's good news. So here John says, if, if you have lacking confidence, if you lack confidence of who Jesus Christ is in your life, it's because of sin that has found a way in like yeast. It has found a way in and it's rising. It's like the sin, like in Genesis. It's crouching at your door. It waiting to slip in and use you. And manipulate you. But John says, but Jesus is greater than your sin. Jesus is greater than your sin. So if you ever have a day when you feel weak, you have a day when you feel like God can't forgive you, you have a day like no matter how many times I ask God, it's the same old, same old. I tell you, get your butt up. Get yourself up, back up. Get on your feet. Or get on your knees. 
and cry out to the Lord your God. Because he's greater than your sin. You don't give in to your sin. Why do you give in to your sin when God is greater than you? Why yield to sin when God crashed it? He destroyed it. He covered it. He showed sin he fought. He's greater than your sin. You said, why do we still sin? Because we live in the flesh. That's why we still sin. The Bible says we sin and fall short of the glory of God. You say, well, I'm a Christian. I'm filled with the Spirit. We can't sin. If the only way you can't sin, brother and sister, is if you're with Jesus in heaven. The Bible says we sin and fall short of the glory of God. The Greek context is we continue to sin and fall short of the glory of God. So yes, there are moments when we get weak. There are moments when our minds deceive us. There are moments when our hearts deceive us. There are moments when our actions deceive us. Mm. But in those moments, we have an advocate with the Father, don't we? Mm. In that moment, we have an advocate with the Father. That's why John says to the church, when you're lacking confidence, Jesus is greater. And then he switches it and says, because, you know, sin makes us feel condemnation. But Romans 8.1, I'll give you this verse, and I'll give you my last point on this point three. God's great power is greater than our sin. Therefore, Romans 8.1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do I have to repeat that? Yes, I think I will. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? So who are you in? Who's got your heart? There you go. Living in grace and mercy and forgiveness, Jesus Christ brings transformation to our heart and life. That transformation changes us to have a desire to want to obey God's command and do what pleases him. That's the last part of this text. That we obey the Lord. And we do what pleases him. We can't do that. If our heart. If our soul. Our spirit. Our life hasn't been transformed. Or our mind hasn't been transformed. If we are changing the course of our life. Because of what Christ has done. We're told throughout the New Testament. That in our own strength. We can do nothing. But we can do all things through Christ. I quoted that before. But in Christ, we can do all things. We have the Holy Spirit at work in our heart and minds. Any of you got the Holy Spirit at work in your life? If you, know, if you don't, you're dead. Because if you're alive, you got Jesus in your heart and life, you already have the Holy Spirit at work in your life. If you want to see him poured out in your life, there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit of which we should be seeking. There's a couple of amens and the rest are saying, what did you say, Pastor? We should be seeking. Why? Because the Holy Spirit speaks to our heart. The Holy Spirit speaks to our heart. He wants to comfort us. He wants to counsel us. He wants to empower us. He wants to lead us. As the Bible says, lead us and guide us into all truth. I heard somebody go. Good, much. Amen. I got amens on the, on the other side of the on the other side of the aisle there. I'm getting amens. I believe it's worth giving the Holy Spirit room to work in our life. And I hope you do as well. I wrap it up with this. God desires to love us and for us to love him and for us to love one another as God loves. There is too much hatred in this world. It's it's hard. It's hard to turn on the TV. And you know, my last time of looking on the news, I don't I, I watch I look at the news on my tablet because I can shut it off so easily and I can pick and choose. And looking at those stories of people who 
yeah, maybe they're they're protesting, but to see an old lady who's just carrying a sign of what she believes in, it's like, all right, that's her. This is America. You have the freedom of assembly. You have a right to protest. It's just like whether you protest for one thing or you protest for another. And those who didn't agree with her protesting, they just went up and they grabbed it, they tore it out of her hands, and they began to beat her. They said one of her, one of the one of the other opponents just co-copped her right in the head. And this is an old lady who's just standing with a sign of someone that she believes in. It's like this is what I believe, and I'm I'm still standing for this. And it's like, why can't you just let somebody stand there and say, This is what I stand for? And just move on, walk away. That's where we have come as a, a nation, that if you, you stand and you speak up on something, you, know, you, risk, you risk having that kind of, or a man that was just there and they grabbed him and they beat him. And it wasn't enough that they beat him, but when they knocked him down, three or four guys got on top of him and they smashed his head until he was unconscious. And all because they were just having this protest. Uh, this weekend in Washington, D.C. It's like, you know, I know it's the, seat, it's the seat of government, and I know it's the hot spot where we've been for the last several months, and I know there's one side that's happy and one side that's sad, and I know the people on the sad side are, they're still, they're standing and some are protesting, but they just, they want to understand. I get that. When you, when you don't understand and you have a hard time accepting where things are, you're gonna you're gonna speak out. And that's my concern is that why can't they just speak out? Because if it was flipped, that would be the same thing, wouldn't it? Wouldn't there be a group that says, I can't accept this or I can't believe it? And they would speak out. Do do they deserve to be beaten down? I don't think so. I know a lot of people those their whose views I don't agree with, particularly politically and socially that they don't deserve my going there and smashing their head in. They, if they're going to protest, they protest. If they do it legally, they do it legally. When they're done, they go home. But when we turn it into the kind of mayhem that we're seeing, we're seeing Portland, Oregon all over again. Only this time we're seeing it in Washington, D.C. And when will it stop? I think the church has got to rise up and the church has got to show a love that the world has long since lost. The church has got to rise up and show a love that the world has long since loved, has long since lost. And we start by loving one another. We start by loving God. In Deuteronomy 6, we love one another. Love your brother, your neighbor, as yourself. And when we can't even really love each other as a church, how does the world get to be reminded of what love looks like? Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. So let's stand together. Lord, we we just we just we need you. As a church, we need you. As a nation, we need you. You said in the last days there would be all kinds of evil. Evil would rage. You said that in the last days what was considered good would now be defined as bad, and what was considered bad will now be defined as good. Lord, we have long since crossed that threshold. We have become a nation divided against itself. I pray, Lord, that the church could just pull together and become a church not divided but united. Not united in our politics or united in our cultures, united in uh, all kinds of other nationality things, but that we would become united in Jesus Christ, first and foremost. We're different people with different backgrounds with different life experiences, but that we come united in Jesus Christ that somehow we would be able to reflect the love of God like the world has never known. Lord, I pray that somehow the church pulls together 
and reflects that love of God in such a way that there will be those in the world who will, even in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their anger and their resentment, in the midst of their stomping their own feet, that they could look at the church and say, is that what we're missing? That they could look at the church and say, that is, they are so different. Why are they so different? Because we have not lost touch and we have not lost sight of what it means to love one another and bear one another's burdens and look after each other and care for each other. That we would recognize the events that go on in our midst. That we would empathize with those who are walking through difficult circumstances. That we would lay down our lives for each other because we recognize the need. And as we're able to, we, we reach out and we help. We lift up and we encourage. We help out in the name of our Lord Jesus all that we could rise up in the love of God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, would you help us, Lord? Help us, Lord. We not get caught in the fray. We don't allow the things of this world to tear us apart. That we will hold on to Jesus. All in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Everybody who loved the Lord said, Amen, amen and Amen.